So, it's always interesting when you do a video which is different. And why is this different? Well, this isn't a winner of the patron votes. This is a, this is a question which was asked so many times and has been put forward so, so many times by Carl that it has managed to crew more votes than any other topic over the last year of the non-winning of the non-winning topics in fact technically it accrued more votes cumulatively over the year than many of the winning topics So it's a fun one to do. And the accusation which I got from one person, which was that I was doing it solely to stop Carl asking this question, is of course completely baseless. I'm not. Uh, actually, it's a fun one. You can tell it's a fun one because it finished fourth or fifth pretty much every time. And that's. That's a good endorsement as far as I'm concerned. But it's also an interesting one to start off with because going all diesel, what is the difference? Well, there are some advantages, there are some disadvantages. There are some major disadvantages, there are some major advantages. Changing over to diesel does not suddenly make problems disappear. There is the fact that even in 1936, German domestic fuels, including their synth fuels, accounted for just 13% of their supply. Include add in Romania and some of the other sources, and you get to a uh, uh, well, a whopping 26% of their supply. The Caribbean accounted for 29% of their supply of fuels. The USA, 25%. The USSR, 12%. Mexico, 9%. So if we think about that, if we're just going with the Caribbean, Mexico and USA, i.e. fuels which will have to cross the Atlantic, then Germany in 1936... is already heavily dependent to the, well, 25 plus 12, that's 37%, and nine, another 9%, and that's 46% comes from across the Atlantic. Theoretically, you can say that Germany goes to war against 58% of its fuel supplies. Let's think about that. 58% of their fuel supplies. It's estimated that between 63 and 72% of the German oil supply in the mid late to late 1930s arrive via tankers. That's oil, not just fuel, not all the other sources of fuel, that's just oil alone. That's a problem. And that's a long-term problem. If you're thinking about it from the beginning, you should be sort of thinking, well, hang on, this is going to happen. How do we prepare for it? And one of the things you could say you could do to prepare for it is diesel. Because diesel is, by and large, more available readily on domestic sources. And diesel is, by and large, more available in terms of synthetic. However, there is also the fact that ship oil tends to be the 
well, let's be honest, ships do not get the finest, finest of oils. Uh, they don't need it. Whereas you are talking about levels of octane and all sorts of beautiful clarity and perfection when you're talking about something that you need for your aircraft, for your ship's engine, basically you have to consider it a ship is... Well, the closest vehicle you would probably have day-to-day -day life in is, is something like a Rolls-Royce. And there is an old tradition of Rolls-Royce engines, I'm not sure quite whether it applies to modern ones, that you could pretty much put whiskey in them and they would run. You could put anything in it and it would get going. Well. It's to an extent similar with ship engines. Now, how well it's going to perform is a completely different matter. But. The interesting thing is, and I'm saying this now before we get into it, the other question which no one thought to put forward was saying, well, could they have run this off alcohol or uh, some other naturally produced fuel supply? And of course, you can produce diesel by growing certain plants. You can produce diesel domestically. So again... There is a theoretical security of supply, and there is the fact that Germany actually has quite a decent supply of diesel throughout World War II. But the thing is, look at what it's supplying with that diesel. Mostly it's supplying some trucks, not many of their tanks. Some of them are... Let's be honest, in, uh, if you stand there and try and say, no German tanks are on this, there's probably going to be a batch that does run on it, because they are produced in such small run numbers. It's kind of like the amount of spare parts, the amount of differences in engines, and all sorts of weird things going on. So, I'm just not getting into, I'm going to avoid the entire mess that is German army procurement. Please, allow me that one thing, okay? Because that would turn this video from being a nice broadly speaking, succinct hour and a quarter, hour and 20 minutes, into a 10-hour slog, and then there's still probably... Well, someone like the Chieftain is probably better to go through all those different tank types and explain the effect of diesel supply and switching to diesel on them. So we're just concentrating on the Navy. And we're not talking about diesel aircraft, aviation power either, uh, diesel, uh, powering diesel aircraft. Although, it is actually possible. And it is the sort of interesting diversion and continuation to go through the whole... Well, the whole system of the Graf Zeppelin, etc. And go, yeah. Diesel. I wonder what happens if you make all the aircraft diesel powered and the ships diesel powered and everything's running on diesel. It makes logistics easy. Might not give you the best operating statistics, but does make logistics easy. You have one fuel type for them all. Admittedly, you also then make diesel probably a far higher priority in British bombing campaigns, because there's already a target because it disrupts the ability of some marines operator or it's the most difficult to disrupt, but, you know... They can do it, but the more you put onto diesel, the more emphasis you put on diesel, the more it's going to go up the criteria of the targeting. And also, the more you put on diesel, the more there are going to be demands on that diesel supply. That's the other problem. So you shift everything to diesel, that's great. But you're going to have to increase diesel supply. You're going to have to put the same effort into it as you're putting into fuel supplies. Well, to boost it as you're putting into other sources of fuel supplies. That's the thing about these questions, is that nothing happens in a vacuum. You've got to start thinking it all through. So, shameless book plug. Da da. Second edition coming soon. 
I'm supposed to have got the corrections to them this week. I will do. I will get them done at some point. He says. You, I will. I will get it all done. It's been a busy week. I spent a lot of time having to deal with university stuff on the first half of the week. Still not going to get paid till next month, though. So let's think about what this all means. Well, if we're thinking about just ships, it's not just the capital ships. The Deutschland class, the torpedo boats and the submarines, are already largely diesel. The Scharnhorst class, Bismarck class, most of the rest of the, the, rest of the destroyers, and the Admiral Hilfer class are all steam. Sorry, I think I've burped a bit there. I'm not sure why, I've just been drinking milk. Hmm. Anyway. It's thinking about drinking all that diesel. The Koinsberg and Leipzig classes were diesel steam. So you have actually got a avenue in here to larger ships, if you think about it logically. So, you must, of course, more automatically think that instead of putting all the effort into developing very, very fancy, high-pressure steam engines, they focus on their diesel engine development. Now... Is that really logical as a possibility? And what's the impact going to be? Well, there's the Leipzig. That is a diesel steam cruiser. Diesel to cruising engines. <laughs> Steam to allow high speed. You could go with a diesel steam mixer, but honestly, that just seems complicated to me, and frankly, could be another reason why I'm not that keen on those cruisers. Dad and I don't like an off center design, I'm just not a big fan of the whole arrangement and the heavy gu the guns being focused on the off I, I know there are logical reasons for it. A vessel which is designed as a mine-laying emphasis, which I've discussed before, and is going to be running away, yeah. I can understand. And in the Baltic, where there are narrow rooms for manoeuvre, yeah, I can understand, but, um... No. But, this provides us with an idea. They were working on it in the 1920s. So, we can go back as far as that. Which means we can go back to before they build pretty much anything. Okay. So, let's think this through. They also build the Brems which is launched in 1932, is all diesel powered, and displaced 1,870 tons. It's a gunnery training ship with a top speed of 29.1 knots. Twenty-nine point one knots. That's fairly decent. Okay, it's not thirty-one, thirty-two knots. But in the scheme of things, it's not a long way off. So let's consider the Brems. It's... Sorry, I typed in Brems to bring up my notes, and the Brems from 1916, the Brummer class cruiser, came up. Not the German training ship Brems from 1932. <laughs> Still a good looking ship. I might do a video about it at some point. Anyway, 
she's launched June 14th, 1932, commissioned July 7th, 1933. Sunk September the 6th by uh, 1941 by British cruisers. She was escorting the uh, troop transports uh, Trautenfels and Barcelona. And she is intercepted by HMS Nigeria and HMS Aurora. She's actually sunk by Nigeria by being rammed. Nigeria decides that she's um, in her way. Uh, some sources um, do differ on this. I, I, I do admit, but uh, many sources do seem to talk about the ramming, and one of the persons who does talk about the ramming is... Um, Philip Vian. So, as I think he was on board at the time, I'm going to go with Vian. But, you know, it's very illogical. Why would another cruiser ram and why would a cruiser ram another cruiser and cut it in half? Well, let's be honest, Bremps is a destroyer. She's the same size as a tribal class destroyer. And she's armed with four hundred twenty-seven millimeter naval guns, uh, four thirty-seven millimeter AA guns, eight twenty millimeter cannon. I uh, could carry two hundred fifty mines. Had thirty millimeter armor belt, twenty-five millimeter deck. But more importantly for us, she is entirely supplied by two man diesel engines, two shafts. 28,400 shaft horsepower and could do 29.1 knots. She also had a range of 3,000 nautical miles, which shows if you build a ship with a terrible fuel tank, then it doesn't matter how good its engine is for a long range endurance, you ain't going anywhere. She actually played HMS Amphion in um, the Let's It Appel, a film taken, uh, which was done in 1939. And for that, she had uh, two additional dummy funnels added. But the point is, she's built. So, you can build something which is diesel powered and relatively fast. Okay. That's our starting point. So, considering all that, I'd say we should first start with the 1934 destroyers. They are two Wagner geared turbines supplying two shafts with 70,000 horsepower for a top speed of 36 knots or 1900 nautical miles at 19 knots okay so we need something that can go faster than 29 knots this is two shafts so how are we going to get this design up? Well, there are options. There are options. You probably need some gearing. You might well need a third shaft. But, if you could tandem up diesel engines, and remember, You'd have to use geared turbines anyway, and with the amount of space you're going to save on boilers and other things, you can probably have the space and wait for this. You can probably get a destroyer which is slightly... which is... Hmm, I'm not sure if you can get 36 knots. If you really obsess with getting 36 knots, you can have trouble. But... 
33 knots would seem doable. It's going to boost its range though. You could be again talking a range of 3,000 or nautical miles. At roughly 19 knots. And why am I saying that? Well, if you have it set up like that, with the diesel engines, you have to decide very quickly, what do I need for cruising? Well, cruising, do I need all six engines running? Do I need all three shafts turning? I can probably cut down my use of fuel by three engines. I can maybe cut it down by four. Take the central shaft out of all out of the work altogether. And maintain nineteen knots. After all Brems did that. So why not? Why not? Well, the starters, there's the speed race going on. There's the French and the Italian destroyers getting faster and faster. And then if we consider it, no one else in the world is building diesel destroyers. So the argument against it is but everyone else has steam and I want to go fast all right what's the utility for destroying going fast well it allows it to maneuver more get closer to its target and allows it to generally cause a lot more potentially cause a lot more damage in this attack run and it's evasion and it, it, it getting out the area afterwards. Okay, speed matters. But could I go for 36 knots? Again, gearing. But this time I'd definitely be talking three shafts and I'd possibly be talking as many as nine engines to get the required shaft horsepower to get me to 36 knots. And it is going to start taking up space, and third shaft, etc., is going to require some arrangement. There is going to have to be some redesigning of the internal space. There is going to have to be some reshaping, perhaps, of the hull. And still, there's the fact that I've got to start doing this without... And this is important... Without really mentioning that I am. Because if I start producing diesel steam destroyers, yeah, they're, everyone produces them. And they're short-legged German destroyers. Everyone knows they're full of the Baltic. Pretty much that's what everyone's thinking about them. Oh, they're producing more Baltic destroyers. Oh, look, their range is only 1,900 nautical miles. That's enough to tootle around maybe in the North Sea, but not go any further. Moment you start building something bigger, mm -hmm. and again, this is a twin shaft arrangement. Six Wagner water tube boilers driving two shafts with a top speed of 36 knots or a range of 2,019 nautical miles at 19 knots. Again, please note this is for the Zestora 1936. This is not the 1936A or the Mob or. All the various other things, this is just the Nazar in 1936. Because if you change the original base model, you are definitely going to be changing all those even more. And you're then into butterflies of butterflies of butterfly scenario. So, again, we pretty much standardized on what the Germans want. They want 36 knots. They'd like more range. You can tell that by the range going up on the, on the, on the 36. But they want 36 knots. They want 36 knots. That's going to be the issue, isn't it? 
it's going to be the 36 knots. It's always going to be the issue is the 36 knots. You can do it with a diesel. Diesel, please don't. You can do it. But the gems themselves don't even do it till 1942. I'll talk about that in a bit. Well, right now. I thought that slide was the next one. After this. Anyway. So this is the Zestora 1942. And you'll notice. It has four 12,600 horsepower engines. Cooked, hooked up by gearing to the single central shaft. And two single... 12,600 horsepower engines on each of the auto shafts. Six diesels driving three shafts with a planned top speed of 36 knots and an operating radius of 5,500 nautical miles at 19 or 20 knots, depending on what you're reading. So, I've been overstating the number of engines needed. Well, I haven't. I'm not that obsessive but these are engines which they're producing in 1942 I've been using the figure in my head roughly of 12,600 horsepower and by the way this is one of the engines built for this it's you can still find it I think today in the Auto and Technic Museum in Sinchen Germany now this vessel was of course never finished I haven't been able to find any World of Warships details on it, so I don't think Dave deployed one, or I've managed to miss it completely in hunting around. And yes, top speed, 36 knots, operating radius of 5,500 nautical miles. Operating radius, 2,090 nautical miles. 1,900 nautical miles. 5,500 nautical miles. Now I've been using, again, the estimation of 3,000 nautical miles based on the Brems. But this is what's happened with technology over, let's be honest, the best part of 10 years of development when diesel power wasn't the emphasis. If diesel power had been the emphasis, we could be talking about something at this level for the 1936. And if we're talking about something at this level for 1936, that creates a very different scenario for the Royal Navy. And pretty much everyone. Because suddenly, any German task group which is going out into the deep, wide ocean can have an escort of destroyers. And if they're using diesel, and the capital ship is using diesel... Then they can supply each other. Which means you have to start changing all your scenarios. If there are destroyers with, with Bismarck and Prince Jürgen, the, the Admiral Hipper class cruiser at the Battle of Denmark Streets, right. then suddenly that's a task force. And that's a far more capable formation than you would have had previously, but also means that the Royal Navy is going to have to think about it. It's not going to be a simple response. then the British are going to respond in kind. Those destroyers which were allowed to lag behind would not have been lagged behind because you can't leave your destroyers behind if the enemy has destroyers. You also can't have your cruisers sitting out a long way away because if the enemy has destroyers because you need those extra guns to hold off the destroyers if they attack so your big ships can concentrate on the enemy capital ships. It turns into, rather than a capital ship on capital ship engagement, it turns into a task group on task group engagement. It turns into a battle. 
It becomes far closer to something like we saw happening in the Mediterranean on a fairly regular basis, where the Italians could and did put up full task groups and balanced forces, rather than the Germans, who were often sending out single individual ships. You also have the reality that with a radio operational radius of 5,500 nautical miles, this thing can go pretty much anywhere it wants in the sort of northern hemisphere. And that's scary. Now, you could still have most of them, the 1934 and 36's dis original ones, destroyed in Narvik. Because let's be honest, the gun fit is not any better. And I'm not assuming the Germans will change the gun fit or their organization or their selection of terrible, terrible weapons for their destroyers. Um, and when I say terrible weapons, they're actually very, very good weapons, but that's the problem. A destroyer at the time is not your elite capital ship, etc. scenario. It is got to be a good enough weapon. And if you choose, this is the perfect weapon for doing this role. Is it the perfect weapon for doing this role from a destroyer? Uh, which is going to be manoeuvring and doing all sorts of weird things. Uh, and if you don't have a sensible answer to that one, then it, the answer is no. Well, you change those engines, suddenly there's a lot of difference going on. There's also a lot of difference in terms of the fueling of the German destroyers. They could escape between the attack by the first battle in Narvik, well, the second battle in Narvik and the third battle in Narvik. Remember, the first one is between the Norwegian forces and the Germans. Between the first one and the second one, they're trapped there mostly by the fact they have lack of fuel. Because their tanker has been sunk. Well, in this scenario, they wouldn't have A, needed to have that tanker going along, and B, they could have gone home already. Dropped off troops and gone home. Suddenly there's no battle of second battle, a third battle of Narvik. There might not even be a first battle of Narvik. Well, there probably would be against, there would be against Norwegian horses. But the second battle of Narvik. The first for the British, but the second for what actually happening there. Might not even happen. The Germans could well have just got, have got dropped off the troops, gone, you're sure, you've got your supplies, bye-bye. We're off. That causes even more fun, because what happens if you have those destroyers then with Sharnos and Nisenel when Renown's fighting them? Now we have the Sharnhorse class. Twelve water tube boilers supplied three turbines that combined to generate up to 151,893 horsepower PS. 149,815 indicated horsepower. Capable of driving three shells for a top speed of 31 knots or a range of 7,100 nautical miles, shell knots or 6,200 nautical miles at 19 knots. For nice now. Again, let's think about the size of diesels you could put in them. Consider the Deutschland class. You scale up, you can go to 31 knots. You start thinking about their range. Deutschland class are capable of 10,000 nautical miles at 20 knots. And a top speed of 28 knots. That will the size of the channel, so you've got the space. You could be talking something with a range of 15,000 nautical miles. You could be talking easily, it could be up to, scaled up to 31 knots. These have three shafts. The Deutschland class have two. They have eight diesel engines. This could have three and twelve. Two shafts for eight on Deutschland class, three shafts for twelve. On the Scharnhorst. Could be talking a very, very long range strike. Imagine if one of these got into the Indian Ocean. And a 
of that scenario. Or the Pacific. 15,000 nautical miles is a very, very long way to go. I mean, it's very scary. Especially for the British, who've got a lot of sea trade which will be in that range. Honestly, it would turn these ships into target numero uno. Like all German surface raiders, but even more so. Admiral Hippers. Again, 32 knots or a range of 6,800 nautical miles at 20 knots. Again, three shafts. So again, you could go for the 12 diesel engines. The free shafts. Again, you could be talking 10, 12,000 nautical miles. It's a lot of range there, but it's all going to be using a lot of diesel fuel. And finally, we have the Bismarck. Well, if you're putting the effort developing the destroyers and everything else for diesel powered, you know, you go for the Bismarck class as well. They have a range of 8,500 and 8,000, 8, 8, nearly 900, 8, nearly 8,900 at 19 knots. You could double that. Maybe more. You could be talking about a range of 18,000 nautical miles. Or you could use the space saved in fuel, etc. to try and make the design far more sensible. And most importantly, if you've gone for diesel engines, they're going to be far more straightforward and easy to put in than the steam turbines, which might actually change some of the inefficiencies in the hulls. And the high-pressure steam... It's also going to change the shaping and structuring of your crew requirements. It's going to have an impact on every area of the design. It really is. So here are the two timeline options. They're interesting. Goinsberg class, 1927. It's an earlier start. Negative, going in all, all out straight away can lead to overcomplicated designs and weird issues, rather like what happened with the German approaches to high pressure steam. But you could also start with the Leipzig class in 1929. Benefit, Goinsberg as 50 50 provides a natural starting point. Negative, two vital years of development of use and use loss, plus you still have steam plants to support. Let's be honest. One means that by the time you are building the Bismarcks, by the time you are building the Hippers, if we consider Admiral Hipper herself, she's laid down in 1935. If you go with the Coinsberg, you started in, she's launched 1927. roughly eight years to the other, ten years prior to launch from uh, from the launch of Coinsberg to the launch of Hipper. That is certainly attractive, but it's a less natural start. It's making them go all diesel very early. When we know when the diesel ships they do try out are in the 1930s. So it would be more sensible to say, well, they started off by going diesel steam and decided the diesel engines were better for development because they found the steam engines difficult to use. So then they went from 1929. 
First question of today, which one would you do? I know which one I went with. I decided to do a purist route. Going to third class, they start off and they go diesel from the get-go. And that's not just because, like the Leipzig class, I would seriously like to redesign these ships. I'm fairly certain if they go the whole diesel route, they can actually redesign these ships because they don't need as many and they don't need the funnel structure like that. So they might well be able to get in a fourth turret. And then I'd be so happy. It would, it would be so much better. It would just be... And the... OCD part of me about ship design would actually be get would uh, would be really really happy with them. And worst point with the engines being like that, versus and the mines needing to still be structured the way they are, etc. You 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 could still move it. The turret could end up being for it could be A B and X or Y whatever you want to call it aft. Probably A B X would be the sensible position so that they had the entire cut down deck space aft for dealing with mines. That would make life so much easier. It really would. It's one of those classic scenarios. I know the logic of why they go through everything they do on this class and why they end up the shape they do. And I can follow their logic and I understand it. I just disagree with it. Because what they're emphasizing and putting as a priority is something I would consider secondary to something to other things that they are putting so and making secondary. So I know why, but no, no. Anyway, so we're starting off with the Kaiserberg class, which means we're starting off in 1927. We're starting off, well, I say 1927. There is, of course, the fact that, well, Coinsbeck herself is laid down in 1926. As is Karl Lusch and Koln. So, you probably could say they'd start, made the decision in 1925, 24. When they're starting to look and design these ships. Which is very, very good. Because if they do start that, then, well, they've already got the uh, two-man ten-cylinder diesel engines is what they put on them. They have four geared steam turbines and two diesel engines. All to drive two shafts. Now, again, I think you probably, considering those particular diesel engines, you're probably going to need well, as it was, to get them to their top speed of 32 knots, they had three geared steam turbines per shaft. Oh, no, they had two geared steam turbines per shaft. And they also had the diesel that could also feed into the gearing. I'm reckoning you would need four diesels. So you'd have to slightly, as I said, you'd have to change the engine layout a bit. Because you need about eight engines to be able to, broadly speaking, give a, broadly speaking, similar top level of performance. A gear will give you an extended range, and it'll give you other capacities, but it's not going to be without its negatives, okay? It's going to be complexity. Once you're multi-gearing engine, uh, multi, basically multi-engine gearing turbine, uh, multi-engine gearing shafts, sorry, so I used to saying geared turbines, he doesn't remember it was the gearing the shafts, it is not the world's most easy system. And I say this thinking more about how the how the Germans try and do it.
but it's doable. It is doable. And it starts you on diesel route earlier. And if it starts you on earlier, then that is going to help you get there. That's going to help you improve. So how does the German fleet change? Well, let's start off by saying the moment you change, and I'm going to get into this live, but in the live more, but the moment you change this, you're changing the operating patterns for the entirety of the war. So there is not a single event which happens the same way. Okay, just take that off the basket. Uh, take that off the floor, you know, don't think about start going, well, how will they fight the Battle of Denmark Straits? The Battle of Denmark Straits will not happen. Or if the Battle of Denmark Straits did happen, it would be completely different. As I said, there'd be destroyers, there'd be other things there, it would be a complete task force versus task force scenario. Battle group versus battle group. And it becomes autom automatically a very different, far nastier fight. And it was nasty enough as it was, but don't expect golden battle golden shells to help you out because again you're dealing with a task group so let's say if the germans you, you've not you now no longer got the scenario whereby you can justify breaking up your task group and your your formation into a carrier in one space a battleship in another space da, 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 and a carrier battleship and a two battle and a battle cruiser and a battleship in your t instead of dividing groups they, you're suddenly dealing with a full task force. Okay, fine. That means you're going to need at least a carrier with both groups. You're going to need a couple of capital ships with both groups. You're going to need both groups to be their own task force. Because you can't match... Well, a ca an enemy capital ship and a cruiser, you can match with a couple of capital ships. But if they're going to guaranteed to have their destroyers there and guaranteed to have... You can't. You can't go in and go, I'm just bringing in my two big ships. No. And that's not how the British operate. So if the Germans change to operate in task force manner, it's going to change how the British operate, what the British are doing. Which means it's going to change every single thing. How is the German fleet going to change? Very, very diesel heavy. There is a part of me which wonders if there might almost be an ag a strategic agreement between the army and the navy, in that the navy gets first use of all the diesel, and the army gets first use of all the fuel, and both do their best to starve the Luftwaffe of anything that they, they want. There, it, It's a very realistic idea for the... Um, the, the, the uh, Kriegsmarine and the... Um, army to do such an agreement. But the entire fleet is going to change. You should expect the cruisers, if you're going for a down diesel route, once you've got a faster long-range asset, I'm, I do wonder if the Deutschland class actually turn out like they do, because if you've already got, if we consider the Deutschland class, right? I'm just checking dates now. <sighs> Joy of dyslexia, I'm just remembering which date. I remember all the dates, but I'm trying to remember which one. Yeah. Deutschland itself is laid down in February 1929. If you've already got cruisers in place, which can go 31, 32 knots and our diesel pad, why would you build a Deutschland class as you do with the top speed of the glorious top speed of 28 knots? No, you're going to build them faster. You're going to build them to be 31. They're propelled by 8 diesel engines on 2 propellers. You'd either give them an extra shaft so put them on the free shafts and 12 engines. Or maybe 9 engines on free shafts. I'm not, I'm not sure how they'd structure it. But you'd have to expect, once they put the effort they have into building these diesel cruisers, already they're going to then improve the Deutschlands. So they're going to be faster, which is going to change their operating characteristics. And once they're at their level of operating characteristics, the Germans are then going to change and adapt other ships they design 
to suit their experience of those operating characteristics. You're going to change the entire German naval force of your design. So none of these ships you see will be built like this. The World War I pre-dreadnoughts and the, the, those sort of things, yeah, yeah the, those vessels, yes, they'll be there. But everything else will be different. Everything else will be built differently. Not a single thing will turn out the same. And I'd be really interested in your opinions and your ideas of how it would change. So, of course, I've talked about Denmark Strait a couple of times, and I said Operation Berlin. Like, this wouldn't happen. But I tried to think through what would be a likely scenario. I think a scenario you would be dealing with is you would deal with a task force being sent out. I think the Germans would still do that. And, of course, they've got, now got the range to take advantage of it. They've got the range. Their destroyers can range out thousands of miles. Imagine that... Imagine how far German destroyers, which fill up in Norway, could range for. And it doesn't matter if they've lost destroyers in Narvik or not, or if they've lost a lot of destroyers in various nasty destroyer fights with British tribal class destroyers, etc. And I'll be talking about those in a second. It doesn't matter. What matters is that they will be thinking in a task force way, so they will put together a task force. They will put together those destroyers. They will put together those cruisers. Again, if you have a Deutschen class and a or a, a sort of Königsberg or Leipzig, and they're we've built with a range and the capability, you could well get a task group forming up of a capital ship, maybe one, maybe two. Maybe a couple of cruisers. A flotilla of destroyers. And that's coming out. And how do you, if the British, act uh, uh, react to that? Well, you're going to have to put together your own task groups. So the thing is, this automatically is going to tie down a lot more British forces in the North Atlantic, which is going to have an impact on the Mediterranean. It's going to tie down a lot more carrier assets for the British. Incidentally, this might actually cause the British to actually build more of, uh, put more effort into both. So one of those interesting scenarios that the reason the King George V's are actually completed off is because of the German capital ship threat and its ability to get out into the Atlantic. To an extent, the Italian also, and the wearing down of the British capital ships, but, you know, it's the King George, uh, the King George V's are built to deal with things like Bismarck going out or Tirpitz going out. Now, you could have a very interesting scenario also going on in that you might have got Vanguard actually put more emphasis on and built and completed sooner. Why do I say this? Because the German surface rate of threat is going to be that much greater. Because of the range of these ships, because their ability to operate long range, uh, very uh, fairly fast and very long way away from home, with those ranges, the British are going to want to be able to counter that. So they're going to want fast capital ships which can run them down. Which means you might have a Vanguard-esque vessel i.e. a fast battleship design in service sooner. It may be built alongside the King George V's. Or it might even change the KGV design. There's always a possibility it does actually change the KGV design. Either way, you will end up with a task group battle. You will end up with a major battle happening in... I would love to say the North Sea, but I have this feeling it'll be in the North Atlantic. There'll be carriers on the British side. Notice I'm saying carriers plural because there's going to be a carrier of each of the British task groups which are trying to hunt them down. 
Again, the British will probably want a couple of capital ships per battle group. And they're going to have to be fast, so you hope you have a vanguard or something available, so you have them. But also, this might be a scenario, i.e. it's caused Repulse and Renown and Hood to all be upgraded earlier. Because of the need for speed to deal with the German surface freighters. Now, as I've said before, the British primary threat for World War II, which they were concentrated on until roughly 1936, was Japan, followed by Italy. It's only when, really, Germany's rearmament has kicked into visibly actually working in 1936-37 that Germany starts to rise up the scale of threats. The thing is... Germany's going to be on that list of potential threats for longer this way around. Because of their range. So whilst they're still going to be the third threat, they are going to be part of it. So the British are going to have to build to adapt it as well. This is going to change the shape of British construction. Which is going to possibly have an interesting impact of making the British fleet even more suitable for the Pacific conflict that comes. Because the British are also going to have to think about long-range assets. You're possibly going to get the British actually investing in places like the Falkland Islands and actually building some more defence there, which could have had longer-term impacts. Why? Because your two options are either you start rebuilding your entire fleet, or you make your logistics hubs more secure. So that if a Scharnhorst or uh, etc. turns up off them, they do not have a nice experience. Again, 9.2 inch guns are probably going to be the key for this. I'm not sure if they would put a 15 inch gun down on the Falklands, but I think 9.2 inch guns might well turn up as sea defences. They might send some 15 inch guns on it. It's going to depend again on the speed of vanguards and King George V's implementations with a view of these longer range, far more dangerous assets. I love that Daily Telegraph article. The task groups will engage. And just like with the Bismarck and every other scenario, the Germans might win the first battle, but they won't get their ships home. The British will see to that. Because the British won't let them get home. The question is going to be the amount of damage they cause en route. Again, if you've got a task force, think about it. If you can fan out destroyers, most of those destroyers, whilst they are not going to be able to win a fight against a tribal class destroyer, could cause horrendous damage to most convoys, which are escorted by... Sloops and Corvettes. Think about it. You're all set up to deal with submarine threats. The rest of the surface navy is supposed to take care of surface threats before they get you, and suddenly there's enemy destroyers turning up? You're in trouble. Same with cruisers. That task group can fan out, pull back together, fan out, pull back together. You're going to be having a nightmare, and the British are going to see that coming. Why are the British going to see that coming? Because the British always approach the scenario of how would we use these systems and what would we do with them. And they then think of the nastiest possible thing they could do with them and then they presume prepare for that. And usually it works out quite well. Sometimes it does work out wrong because there's a failure of imagination, but usually as a rule, the British imagine what would be the nastiest, meanest thing they could do with something is a fairly good approach to take. What... What is going to happen here is largely going to depend on how the British approach the scenario. I have a feeling they're going to go two ways. One, I wouldn't be surprised if they put emphasis on carrier construction because Aircraft as oceanic search and strike to slow down tools have been a core part of British doctrine by this point, by the point of 1936, but by any point in the 1930s when we're talking about this really, for about a decade and a half by this point. 
let's be honest, we're starting uh, starting off, let's say, start off in 1933, the British really started buying a pension, 1936 when they start, and traditionally start seeing the Germans turning in 37 when they start building to count them. 36, 33, that's roughly 1500 years, the British search and, search and slow have been a doctrine for British naval aviation. And what they do to Bismarck. So the Germans still have the same number of vessels they had, but they're far longer ranged, which means they can operate over a far larger area, which means you don't have to have greater coverage. You get that one of through one of two ways. One, you'll either invest in the coastal air, uh, coastal command and all its aircraft, but I doubt the RAF is going to want to because they're still going to want all the large aircraft for their bomber command. So. That's not an option, so then the second option for the Royal Navy is aircraft carrier construction. Next big impact, again, is probably going to be destroyer construction. Again, if you're going to need your destroyers and need them to be escorting with you in the middle of the North Atlantic, suddenly the big destroyers like the Tribals make a lot of sense. I wouldn't be surprised if from... The tribals onwards, when you're getting two to three flotillas of tribals uh, destroyers being ordered a year, you now get a tribal class level size destroyer ordered at least one flotilla of with two of the regular destroyers. I wouldn't be surprised if the British are building as many of the larger destroyers as they can. Principally, principally from the perspective of it gives them the escorting vessels they need. Now, the other scenario you're possibly going to see from all this is the Battle of the River Plate playing out far more. Because there is the scenario that the Germans find themselves with these beautiful long-range assets, Scharnhorst, Deutschlands, all other crews that come with it, and they go full surface radar. This would fit with their doctrine. And they deploy as many of them as they can prior to World War II. And they will cause a horrendous amount of damage. There will be a happy time for surface raiders because there'll be so just so many of them out there. They'll disrupt British trade tremendously worldwide. They'll cause horrendous, horrendous damage. But every single one of them will die. Maybe one will make it home. Probably the one called Deutschland, which is called home before it even begins. But they will all die. Ultimately because they can't get home. And because the British will be hunting. But it is again going to change the scenario because instead of the German Navy being a submarine threat which you're concentrating on building escorts of, it's going to have a surface action capability threat, which means you're going to have to change your orientation again. How's this going to change things? Well... It probably won't change the Corvettes much, because they're built for rapid construction anti-submarine. I could see them potentially getting a double 4-inch mount or something put forward. Because they have double mounts they can mount those guns onto. And they have designs they could build. And purely that is to give them just slightly more collective firepower if a surface threat turns up to a convoy. But that's really more about enough firepower to buy convoy time for scatter than enough firepower to win. It would be interesting to see what would happen to the VNW class destroyers, which do the oceanic escort duties. I have a feeling they could retain a more capable surface combatant capability than they traditionally do. I could also see escort carriers, etc., produced in uh, coming in earlier. Again, from the point of view of, you've now got a service for it to deal with. You are making the job of dealing with the convoy, protecting convoys, far, far more difficult. 
Because let's be honest, for most of the Atlantic crossing, the convoy threat is rather one-dimensional. It's submarines. Occasionally aircraft turn up, and they're annoying, but they're ones or twos maximum of aircraft at a time, which is problematic, but not an insurmountable uh, problem. Whereas, if you've got surface threat, as in a task force potentially out there, potentially could come out, that's a far bigger problem. You might also see far more of a scenario of convoys being escorted by older battleships. Again, the R-Class suddenly have a very real job. A job which is going to be very important, and you might end up with an entirely different narrative about them, because they could end up involved in some very interesting fights in the middle of the ocean. It could be an R-Class versus a Deutschland, or something else, for a convoy. At which point you hope the R-Class has had some upgrades in terms of its fire control. Nothing else much you can really do with the vessel, but you can upgrade its fire control, and if you've given it radar, fire control, etc., it could be frigging dangerous. It's not fast. It's not going to be able to catch them, but they're also not going to be able to hang around the convoy, because if they do, 15-inch shells are going to rain down on them. But, still it will have an interesting impact. Longer ranges though. It won't be easy though, because when you start orientating yourself around one fuel, yes, you've suddenly made it multiplied the assets which you can use for surface operations, which is great, and gonna make the British task that much more difficult, but you've just made the British task that much easier in terms of crippling your fleet. Because diesel doesn't just supply your submarines and your motor torpedo boats now, it supplies your large ships. Which means if I'm the British, I'm going to start targeting your diesel supplies. I'm going to do everything I can to reduce them. That's going to make life more problematic. That is going to lead to issues internally. What are those issues going to be? I can't really predict. There is a finite supply of diesel v v which is viable and able to be made. That is going to be, of course, increased over the existing war levels, as we understand them, because, of course, if you're investing in it the same way you've been investing in steam, because you've gone um, the steam and oil, because you've gone the diesel route, you are going to be, have to invest in that fuel production. You're going to have to invest in that supply. Which could well help them. They could have far more synthetic diesel production, etc. going on. Far more sort of diesel from arable sources production going on. And every little helps. But again, if you're going for arable sources and you're using that for diesel, then you're not using it to grow food. If you're not using it to grow food, where you're getting the food for your people. I suppose, in summary, what I'm saying is this is a lovely idea to think about in terms of operation and capacity of the German Navy. However, it's not going to be it's not going to give you a guaranteed trump card because the British will react. The British will react as early uh, earlier probably they do. Well, l let's put it this way. The moment you're showing something which is that capable, the British will be forced to react. And not just they will react, but others will react as well. Secondly, the moment you do that, and you set yourself on a scenario where you have to start picking between food or fuel production, food is going to win over fuel because everyone's going to support it. And that's a problem for you. If you're getting it from other sources, that's great. But that's still going to leave you open to attack and concentration on your diesel supplies in order to cripple your fleet. Key ship series. 
should have started already on Friday, uh, on Friday night, and there's another one tomorrow night on Sunday night. Remember, the ones which take place on the Sundays and Thursdays will be premieres because I want you to all. I, 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 I like the community we've managed to build on the channel, and I don't want to get in your ways of having uh, being able to have conversations with each other. So, hope you enjoy those. And mom, thank you for your support, thank you for your help, and I hope you enjoyed the video. And final question. I've talked about the British fleet's reaction, and I've talked about the German fleet and my likely scenario for what I think happens there. I would like you, below, if you have different views on the British fleet, I'll, I'm happy to hear those, or the German fleet, happy to hear those, but really I'd like to hear what you think the French, the Italian, the American, the Japanese might do in a scenario where the Germans are doing all this, are building this diesel fleet. Might others copy them? Might others go for a diesel powered fleet? Imagine Yamato with diesel power. Think about it. And next week we have... <whistles> Navigation. From shores to satellites, thousands of years of getting to from A to B. Although, actually, I'll be recording in about mm, an hour and a half after I've cooked lunch. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching, and have a nice day.